Hear now the word of the Lord as it is written in the book of 1 Kings, portions of chapter 21. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I might have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? So he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, you now exercise authority over Israel. Arise and eat food and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth with high honor among the people. And seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him, that he may die. So the men of the city, the elders and nobles who were inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent to them. And it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is, in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. Then Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. 
because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was, when Ahab heard those words, that he tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on his body. He fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. But in the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Reading further from the book of Matthew, portion of chapter 5. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it away from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And finally, from the Heavenly Doctrines, a portion of the Arcana Celestia, number 4763. And he rent his garments. That this signifies mourning is evident from the signification of rending the garments as being mourning, namely, on account of truth having been destroyed, or because there was no faith. We often read in the word, especially the historic, of persons rending their garments. But the origin of this is not known at the present day, and it is also unknown that it was representative of grief on account of truth being lost. Here end the lessons. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. The word is not a legal document. The word is not a collection of truths acting as walls or barriers to what we want. Even though it sometimes seems this way. Often the word is described this way. Thou shalt not steal. Love thy neighbor. Shun lusts as an offense to the nostrils. All of these things are true. But if we think of truths as obstacles to our life, even if we in theory acknowledge their authority, then we risk killing Naboth and stealing the vineyard of the Lord. Do not look for excuses to get around the truth. And when you ache to evade the truth you know, beware the honeyed words of Jezebel. Our story is about Ahab, king of Israel. Ahab is an evil man. Ahab is described as the most evil king, the most vile, the worst. Of all the evil kings of Israel, Ahab was the worst. He instituted the worship of Baal. He presided over the death of the Lord's prophets and the corruption of the kingdom of Israel. Ahab was as bad as it got. In this particular story, however, Ahab is the central character, not the antagonist. 
For several weeks, we have been following Elijah as he struggles against Ahab. But now that Elijah has defeated the prophets of Baal, gone to Mount Horeb, and returned to Israel stronger than ever, we are given a story about Ahab. This story is a warning told in three parts through three scenes. Ahab and Naboth, Ahab and Jezebel, and finally Ahab and Elijah himself. It is a story of desire, justification, and mourning. It begins with desire. Ahab sees a plot of land next to his palace owned by a man named Naboth. Ahab goes to Naboth and tries to convince Naboth to part with this land. On the face of it, this seems innocent enough. Ahab is merely offering to buy the vineyard or to swap land with Naboth so that Ahab, the king, can get what he wants. Our own lives are full of desires and wants, and this is fine. This is fine. The Lord is not asking us to banish desire or or motivation from our lives. The problem here is that Ahab is asking for something he simply cannot have. Ahab can't have Naboth's vineyard. Naboth's reply is actually a reminder to the king of the ancient law established by the Lord regarding land in Israel. He says, Jehovah forbids that I give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Forbids. The land does not really belong to Naboth. It belongs to the Lord. And when the Israelites first entered the land, the Lord gave each tribe and each family a specific plot of land for them to steward. This is the land that Ahab is trying to get. Ahab is trying to break Mosaic laws that have governed Israel since they first arrived. Naboth refuses to acquiesce. In our lives, this is no ordinary desire. Ahab's plan is to take the vineyard that Naboth cultivates and turn it into a vegetable garden for his own personal use. This isn't the simple want for security or entertainment or job satisfaction. This is the desire to own what properly belongs to the Lord and turn it to our own use. This is not, however, a desire to reject completely the word of the Lord. It's not. Let us ask, have you ever set out to steal from the Lord? Have you ever, with forethought and planning, intended to fight the Lord? No. This is a story for people who have already acknowledged the word. Ahab acknowledges, however grudgingly, Naboth's claim to the land. Now, we might not set out to fight the Lord, but have you ever felt that a particular truth, a particular doctrinal idea, has gotten in your way? Of course, we accept the word. Of course, we think we should follow the word. But what about those ideas that refuse to play along in our lives? We all have truths, either statements in the Old and New Testaments or in the heavenly doctrines, that seem to get in our way. On the one hand, we accept, in theory, that the Lord knows best how life and happiness and salvation work. But on the other, We desire to ignore or downplay or avoid certain ideas. We desire to plow under the Lord's vineyard. 
we desire to treat the word as a legal document in which there may be loopholes or exceptions. And Naboth is unequivocal. No, no, you can't have it. The Lord says no. Didn't make a counteroffer. He didn't suggest an alternative. He didn't pad his refusal or seem at all sympathetic. Pause for a moment. Imagine Ahab's frustration. He just wants the vineyard. Yes, we should love the neighbor, but does that mean every person at the meeting? Yes, greed leads to misery, but does it have to lead to misery today? Naboth and his vineyard represent heavenly uses, heavenly good, the church. Doesn't that sound like something we should want to have? Keep in mind, Ahab did not ask for some wine from the vineyard. He wanted to change the vineyard. He wanted to get rid of Naboth. Naboth, or Naboth in Hebrew, means fruits, the one bearing fruit. This vineyard is the good and useful things that come from living in the Lord. We sometimes want these things on our terms. We want to take the holy and make it convenient. We want the Lord to rearrange the ancient laws of happiness, salvation, so that we can do things our way, just as Ahab wants to rearrange the ancient laws of land allotment. This is what Ahab wants, to own the Lord's land and change it to suit his needs. And then he finds out that there is no deal, no way this is going to happen. Ahab is stuck with Naboth and his vineyard as a neighbor, much as we are stuck with truths we see, but are not to our liking. So he sulks, he refuses to eat, he refuses to talk to anyone, and in general behaves badly. Children often act this way when they're foiled, openly pouting, folding their arms in stubborn denial. Adults do this too, just not often in the open. Everyone sulks like Ahab sometimes. We never should, but we sometimes do. And this begin, brings us to our second scene. Jezebel shows up. Once she finds out why Ahab is upset, she promises to make it all better. Jezebel soothes Ahab. She assures him that he deserves what he wants. He is king, after all. She tells him not to worry. She will get the vineyard for him. Who among us has not at some point in life been soothed by the idea that we were the wronged party? It's not our fault that the truth is so unyielding. Jezebel, the heavenly doctrines tell us, is in a general sense faith alone. Jezebel is thought apart from kindness. Jezebel is false reasonings. Jezebel is justification. Whenever your mind is probing the truth, looking for loopholes, looking for excuses to feel anger or lust or contempt, Jezebel is writing your letters and using your seal. When we think the truth we acknowledge is a barrier to our happiness, the Jezebel of our minds gets to work justifying what we want. Jezebel is good to her word. Through deceit and violence, 
she gets Naboth killed. With nobody to contest his claim, nothing stands in the way of Ahab taking the vineyard and making his vegetable garden. Jezebel tells Ahab, and he goes up to claim his new land. Remember, Jezebel is justification. This is not describing the outright rejection of a truth. This story is about truths we acknowledge and still don't like. This story is about truths we wish would serve our desires, but don't. Ahab, our evil desires, does not kill Naboth. It's not Ahab. Justification in the person of Jezebel she kills Naboth. We know we have to love the neighbor, but perhaps we find ways to love some, neighbor, some neighbors more than others, conveniently never seeing the good in those who stand against us. The word does not countenance greed, but the heavenly doctrines do say we have to take care of ourselves, and they don't say how, Specifically, we might say to ourselves, I'll be much nicer to the people around me if I have everything I want. So I'm actually trying to be as nice as I can be. That's all. This is justification. This is legalistic dancing. This is pretending the word is a legal document. This is Jezebel writing letters, framing Naboth, and having him killed. This is wrong. And this is often invisible to us. The mind does a thousand things behind every thought. We don't always know what comes from our actions, where our speech comes from, and it takes a great deal of effort to see our own intentions. And sometimes we do not. Sometimes Jezebel writes the letters without Ahab knowing. When Jezebel tells Ahab to come get his vineyard, he does. The sulking is over. We have found our loophole, our technicality, our legalistic perspective, which lets us keep our acknowledgement of the word while getting what we want from the word. Have you ever realized with relief that it was all right to be mean to someone? That is always false. Have you ever found a solution in your life that merely required someone else to pay the price? Have you ever convinced yourself that this time was an exception? This time was special. This time, there were extenuating circumstances to letting evil have its way. Does examining it put it in a different light? This feeling of relief, of triumph, or smugness that comes with justification, this is what played across Ahab's face as he looked around his vineyard, planning its destruction. It was his, all his, and he hadn't done anything wrong. And then Elijah shows up. This is the third scene in the story of Naboth's vineyard, Ahab and Elijah. Elijah tells Ahab that he has sold himself to do evil. The Lord has also directed Elijah to tell Ahab exactly what Jezebel, in his name, has done. Not stopping there, Elijah then goes on to describe the punishment. A violent death for Ahab on the very land on which he now stands. A violent death for Jezebel. And the complete extermination of Ahab's dynasty. For this crime, for violating the Lord's ancient laws regarding the land... Ahab will be wiped out. 
Elijah condemns Ahab the way our conscience can condemn us. Remember that Ahab is fully convinced of Elijah's power by now. And neither Ahab nor even Jezebel do anything to try to stop Elijah. At this point in our story, Elijah is too powerful to kill or even ignore. This story about justification is about a person with a strong conscience. A person who has been to Mount Carmel and seen the fire of the Lord. This story is about an Elijah who has heard the still small voice. We have acknowledged the word. We've had some victories and temptation. And yet, the Lord has more in store for us. Elijah informs Ahab what Jezebel has done. Our conscience, informed by the truth that we have already acknowledged and adopted, shows us the results of justification. Make no mistake, when we treat the truth as a legal document, when we try to get around the truth, when we think interpreting the truth is a game to be won, we have killed Naboth and claimed his vineyard. We have taken the heavenly uses and happiness that come from living the truth and have twisted them to suit our needs. This climactic meeting is the moment when we realize that we have abused the truth. Does the Lord really want us to act like Ahab? The verse just before this, we read that nobody was as bad as Ahab. And yet we see Ahab acting contrite, mournful for what Jezebel has done. He didn't know. He didn't do it. It isn't his fault. These are the words of justification. He didn't do it. Reject them. Ahab did, and it saved him. The original doom that Elijah had placed on Ahab was the complete annihilation of Ahab's family. After Ahab showed remorse, he received a reprieve. It will still happen, but not while Ahab is king. Elijah promised Ahab that because he was contrite, because he was sorry, the horrors coming would wait until he was gone. Ahab is still evil, after all. Ahab still symbolizes evil desires that will eventually have to go. We in our lives are going to see a lot of Ahab. And yet, if we are sorry, if we reject our justification, we also get a reprieve. When we tear our clothes, when we are upset at how we have approached the truth, we mourn not merely from guilt, but in our resolved change. The Lord knows we can't change all at once, and even Ahab can serve a use. Ahab's family has to go, but we don't have to worry about that right now. It is enough that we reject false reasonings that justify evil. This will lead to the end of Ahab's dynasty, what does this rejection of justification look like? This week, be on the lookout for the frustrated desire of Ahab. This week, beware the justification of Jezebel. This week, tear your clothes and ask for forgiveness. If you see yourself frustrated by the truth, take a moment. Is Jezebel promising to make it all better? Are you secretly looking for a way around the truth 
you have already accepted? Instead, submit to the truth you see. Refuse to act on justification. Love the Lord, love the neighbor. The word is not a legal document. The word is our living, loving Lord. His laws are forever, and his love is infinite. If we say we are sorry, if we wish we had not justified our evil, if we resolve to do better and be better, that's all he asks. Do not despair that Ahab and Jezebel remain, for Elisha is coming. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. Thank you for listening. To learn more, visit newchurch.org. And to connect with other people, visit us at groups.newchurch.org.